Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Today is Tuesday, November 10th, and we have a very special group of speakers today. We're really thrilled to have these four uh, tremendous researchers here who are with us today to speak about gender, family, and home and work during this critical time in our pandemic. Before um, I pass it over to Alan to introduce our speakers, I just wanted to um, discuss a few things that have happened since our last class, which was amazingly uh, less than a week ago. And so much has continued to shape um, our country. Um, it's hard to imagine much more happening in the span of what is basically five days. Um, obviously the um, results of the election have been um, determined. Um, there is still obviously ongoing back and forth between the two administrations, but I think in the context of COVID, what this potentially means is a huge uh, shift in how the national response is going to now um, be leveled across our country. And I can think of no better representation than to have a um, tremendous number of phenomenal people who are on the new um, task force that's assigned to ensure that we have an appropriate response to this pandemic. And as you know, um, one of our prior speakers here, Dr. Atul Gawande is one of those members. And as someone who um, also works at the Brigham, I'm thrilled to see that my co-resident Vivek Murthy, um, who's a dear friend of mine is, is co-chairing that. Um, as well as Marcela Nunez Smith, who was um, a resident who was just a year in front of me. So we have three members of the Brigham community who are, who are on this task force. And just a, another reminder of the expertise we have here at Harvard um, across all of these disciplines. It's really, for me, a welcome sight to see this expertise. And um, I see this as an opportunity to bring um, medicine, public health and science and um, addressing issues of diversity and inclusion back into the conversation around our COVID response. So I wanted to at least mention that in this context. I also wanted to mention some big news out from Pfizer yesterday. As you recall, we had um, a discussion devoted entirely to vaccines. And as you all um, hopefully have seen in the news that we are seeing some very promising efficacy of um, a vaccine coming out of Pfizer. We have a lot um, we still need to learn, particularly related to long-term safety, as well as um, supply chain issues, particularly in relation to the need for this to have um, what we call a cold uh, chain and the need for this to remain basically a very cold vaccine to be administered, which brings in all sorts of issues of distribution globally. So that's something to be watching out for. And I just wanted to flag that for your attention. And finally, um, the last point I'll make before I hand this off to Alan is, you know, the very personal nature of this conversation for me as a physician uh, married to another physician who has a child, um, we are very much experiencing this moment. Um, this is a very personal space for me. Um, and I'm really, I've looked towards these leaders for their um, rigor that they bring to this conversation. And I'm so eager to be learning from them today um, about the impact that we have seen COVID have, particularly in the context of gender um, and family and work. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Alan to introduce our amazing speakers today. Thanks, Ingrid. I would just reiterate one thing that you just observed. What a, I'm so used to teaching historical aspects of disease and what happened in the past, sometimes thinking about its contemporary relevance, but to be living through the pandemic, to be experiencing this really, you know, crisis surge at this time of the year, not just here in the United States, but around the world, and to watch a an election and a transition in a major country in the midst of a pandemic is really quite a remarkable story in and of itself. And I think it's sometimes a struggle in the, in the course of the course to realize just how momentous and difficult and divisive and 
important these kinds of changes are. I would also just say one thing, the vaccine is really just a remarkable accomplishment, but the issues of how to get vaccines into people and who they will go to and how we will get them there may turn out to be just as challenging as the scientific issues were around the production of a safe and effective vaccine. So those will be things for us to watch closely. Um, today, we have a really remarkable session on one of the critical issues that the epidemic has revealed and impacted. And we started the course with the notion that we would look at the pandemic as affecting almost all aspects of life and look at it as revealing some of the most fundamental inequalities in global societies and especially here in the US. And we've looked at some of those things already about essential work, frontline workers. We've looked a lot at questions that are associated with structural racism and health disparities. But today we really want to examine closely fundamental problems of gender, gender and work and the labor force and issues that are deeply historical, but are illuminated in extremely powerful ways in the context of the pandemic. And fortunately we have um, four guest faculty members today who have really explored problems of gender and equality in their work, but they've been looking very critically at how their understanding of those problems are reflected and refracted in the pandemic and how the pandemic is affecting fundamental issues of gender, inequality, income, and work. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Hannah Bowles, and she is the co-director of the Women in Public Policy program at the Harvard Kennedy School, where she is also a senior lecturer in public policy and management. And Dr. Bowles has worked for a long time on fundamental issues of gender, race, and identity, fairness, and justice and especially women's leadership and negotiation. And it's really fantastic to get her reflections on how the pandemic has affected and will affect some of those profoundly important issues moving forward. Our second speaker will be Professor Claudia Golden. And Professor Golden is an economist in our Department of Economics. Um, she also has a leadership position at what is well known in Cambridge as NBER, but stands for National Bureau of Economic Research. And that's a research institute that brings together economists and scholars from around the world to focus on critical problems. She leads a study group there on gender in the economy. Professor Golden's work is really notable and I say I appreciate it especially because it's deeply rooted in historical scholarship on um, labor and the history of labor and especially women's labor. But her work is also focused on issues that are crucial in thinking about long-term aspects of women in the workforce, um, inequality in wages and the wage gap. And um, she's, really the most remarkable scholar of the history of the economy as it has affected women through the course of the, really going back to the 19th century, but into the 21st century. Our third speaker will be Professor Julie Batalana. And Professor Batalana is a professor at the Harvard Business School um, in their unit on organizational behavior. And I think she's our first speaker from HBS. Um, Ingrid and I worked very hard to try to engage faculty across the university for the course. And it's wonderful to have a representative from the business school here today. Her work is also centered on fundamental questions of inequality, 
um, work, um, she has focused on what's called divergent changes. And some of these are purposeful in which you would say, how do we change an organization to reflect issues of equality and fairness? But also she has thought deeply about the divergent change that COVID really presents and the recognition of fundamental inequalities, especially re relating to gender as it relates to COVID, but also some of the really powerful potentials in the pandemic to rethink issues of democracy, gender, inequality, and justice. And she's the author, the co-author of a major treatise um, called um, The Working Manifesto. Um, and it's been widely circulated Hundreds of scholars, thousands of scholars, I think, have signed it around the world. And um, it's really, I know with, you have a link to it in your syllabus, but it's a remarkable document about the potentials inherent in the pandemic to rethink how things are. And finally, our fourth speaker today is my friend and colleague from the Department of the History of Science, Professor Sarah Richardson who also is, has a joint appointment in um, studies of women, gender, and sexuality, where she's currently the chair. And Professor Richardson's work centers on the relationship of our understanding of the biological differences associated with gender, but in a deep social, cultural, and political context. And, um, her work ranges across fundamental issues of gender, sexuality, philosophy, and history, but she has recently been the founder and co-director of the Gender Sci Lab. Um, and they are looking explicitly at gender differences in the pandemic and what they mean, how to interpret them, how to count them. And I think there's a link to her COVID-19 gender tracker on our syllabus, but we'll make sure we put it up. But it's a remarkable initiative to try to understand the role that gender plays in the pandemic. So as you can see, we've been able to get some really great thinkers today together to think about issues of gender inequality and how they intersect with other fundamental inequalities like race and and class. So we'll start with Dr. Bowles. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. Let me put up my slides. So I anticipate that I will be um, flagging some um, points that the subsequent speakers will um, delve into more deeply. Um, I'm going to talk about gender in the COVID era, I want to, I know you all have been talking about how crises reveal fault lines in societies, the, the cracks in the infrastructure, the weakest points. Um, crises are also an opportunity um, for change, for potentially transformational change. So what I want to talk about both is um, urgent current concerns, but also higher hopes. So I'm assuming my slides are showing and I can proceed. Okay, great. So I also, when I talk about gender, I wanna draw a distinction between um, gender in terms of how that is assigned to the way people self-present and gender as a kind of archetype. So, um, and I, I'm gonna talk about the implications of um, where as I see them from COVID-19 in kind of both respects. So um, there are these archetypes and I'm simplifying here in this, in the, um, for the sake of time between a kind of, archetype of masculine dominance of the capacity to um, have power over, to control, to compete, um, and um, what is considered kind of the feminine archetype of care. Um, care uh, within the home, certainly within the family, but also within the community. And these larger gendered archetypes tend to get assigned to people who um, self-present as uh, male or female, that uh, women are expected to be feminine, men are expected to be 
masculine. Um, this has historically been, um, you know, even more tightly the case um, than it is today. I think we are growing uh, now in our recognition that um, women can be both masculine and feminine, uh, as can men. So um, I want to talk about uh, people and the implications of the uh, statistical analyses. You know, how are we thinking about the implications of the current crisis uh, for men and women and uh, people who are transgender or identify as transgender or queer? Um, but um, I also want to talk at the end um, about these ideas of gender as an archetype and whether or not we might there might be um, some potential there for positive transformational change. So let me start with my urgent concerns. Um, the first one is uh, job losses and not only job losses, but job departures. So um, those area, this I've got here to the right, a graphic produced by the National Women's Law Center based on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics showing that the current unemployment rate right now hovers around 6% overall, but it is higher um, for uh, women of color and um, for even higher for women um, with disabilities. Um, it's also higher for young women when you combine, according to this report, um, young women with black women, you get again, uh, an unemployment rate of something like 15%. So what we're seeing is that some of those sectors who, that have been hardest hit, retail, hospitality, are those that are um, where women are heavily represented, but in particular women of color. And so um, there has been the discussion about a she session. Now in part, this has to do with women losing jobs in these sectors that are most affected. But the other critical factor in um, a component of the she session is the sudden and sub sustained um, backflow of caregiving and educational labor into the home. And so what you're seeing is that because that care labor typically falls um, on women, you are seeing women um, struggling to um, balance both that unpaid care labor and their paid work so that they are not only reducing their hours, but they're, the statistics seem to be suggesting that they are actually withdrawing from paid labor. And Al, uh, Alicia Modestino, who's been a mentee of Claudia Golden, who you'll hear from, um, was one of the, she was so smart in her studies of the recession to actually ask, you know, if you've lost your job, why? And she found that disproportionately women are, 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 are reporting that they're stepping out of the workforce, um, uh, unable to sustain labor because of conflicting caregiving concerns. Now, I want to highlight to take also a global perspective that another sector that has been acutely affected by the pandemic is the informal sector. So globally, a majority of workers are actually in the informal sector. And my little pink and blue graphic gives you a little sense of what the informal sector is if you're not familiar with that term. But these are people who are working off the grid, right? So they are not these are not the people to whom policies are being directed, um, whether that's loans or provision of PPE or um, health coverage or anything like that. So you've got um, masses of people are kind of falling out of the formal policy space who are among those most affected. And again, um, what you see is um, that women are overrepresented in this informal sector. Another factor that affects people is domestic violence. We know from uh, past pandemics and economic downturns that both um, pandemics and economic crises increase the rates of domestic violence. Again, thinking about those least privileged, there is also a relationship between um, economic privilege and one's risk of domestic violence. Anybody is vulnerable to domestic violence, but they're evidence suggests that there are higher rates of domestic violence among um, the underprivileged. And so we also know that not only is this harm occurring at higher rates, but again, we know from past research that there's a negative association between economic participation and the experience of abuse. So this may be another factor that um, dims the potential um, for uh, women um, and uh, people who are vulnerable to participate in the economy. I want to go back to bodies and how people self-present. There's a lot of discussion right now, as I mentioned already, about the she session and the dis 
disproportionate burden that women are carrying as a result of the pandemic. But we shouldn't forget, we don't have as good um, statistics on the situation of people who are transgender, non-binary, or um, identify as queer. Um, but we know that um, those populations are typically among the least economically privileged and among those most vulnerable to domestic violence. And so I think we have to be um, keeping in mind that um, that is another source of gender inequality that we should be finding ways of addressing. Okay, higher hopes. Can we turn this toward a positive? Where do I see a kind of glimmer of light in all of this? One is that historically in times of crisis, um, particularly our heroes have been associated with men. They are the, the soldiers, the firefighters, the police officers. Typically we associate our heroes very often with masculinity. And what is happening here in the current crisis is that we have women at the front lines being clearly recognized as the heroes in response to the pandemic. And in some parts of the world, I've, excuse me, I've seen statistics showing that, you know, upwards of 90% of the frontline workers on the pandemic are women. So you're seeing this kind of loosening of a notion of heroism with masculinity and a recognition of femininity and care work with heroic labor for the society. We also have seen a, a celebration of women as leaders. And, and also we've just seen in the past week, the election of a US president whose leadership narrative was actually being a single parent and having the capacity to empathize and care for others. So what we have right now is an ascendance of, again, these, um, the feminine archetype with our leadership. Last thing I'll highlight is that we're also seeing an ascendance of recognition of the importance of care work also um, in paid in, in relation to paid labor. So we're seeing uh, employers actually, you know, working desperately to um, help um, employees reconcile their unpaid care labor and to also, um, there's, there's growing access to remote work. We're also seeing evidence is suggesting, survey evidence suggests that at least for egalitarian couples, men are participating more in care labor. So Claudia will pick this up more, but, but she has argued that this is sort of the last stage, I think at least for college educated women of how to close the gender gap if they didn't have to pay um, for more predictability and flexibility in their work. And there may be hope in this pandemic for a more gender equality in family care, but also more integration of um, uh, flexible work into paid labor. So I'll leave it there. And um, look, I'm so eager to hear from our other speakers. Thank you so much. Those are such important ideas. And I have to admit, the course has been so sobering in so many ways. But the recognition that there could be positive changes on the other side of the pandemic seems to me an important thing for us to be thinking about now, if those things are going to be possible. So our next speaker is Professor Golden. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so never before uh, have um, those working on the front lines been asked to bring danger into their homes. Uh, never before have we needed to shut down the economy to get it running again. Never before has a recession impacted women more than men, that is a recession in the US. And never before um, has the care sector been so related, so intertwined with the economic sector. Uh, women are now almost 50% of the labor force. And so we need to make certain that they do not sacrifice their jobs because of care issues. And we also need to make certain that they don't sacrifice their children uh, for their careers and their jobs. In mid-March of 2020, we descended from BCE, which means before the corona era, uh, into something that I'll call DC, which is during corona. And most workers sheltered in place and worked from home. And I'm gonna be focusing on uh, a special group 
which is uh, heterosexual couples, college graduate, employed adults, and their families. And I use the American Time Use Survey, known as the ATUS, to compute childcare hours of mothers and fathers by the age of the youngest uh, child. And that's on the horizontal axis is the age of the youngest child. Uh, these parents and their children are clearly, uh, as, as Hannah uh, indicated, in a very fortunate category. The child care, the weekly hours of mothers are given here, and this is BCE in the old world, and they're given by these dark blue bars, and the fraction of total parental child care hours that women did is given above the bars. Before the corona era in BCE, college graduate employed mothers living with college graduate employed fathers, uh, and these are all parents, were doing around 60% of total childcare hours. Uh, that does not include housework for which women did about 70%. In mid-March 2020, almost 90% of school-age children were not physically in school <clears throat> and most childcare facilities had been shuttered. That greatly increased childcare demands, but there was also something else. And that is that there was more parental sharing since many households, in many households, both parents were at home full time. And consequently, the fraction of childcare performed by the mothers fell, even as total childcare hours, you can see here, just about doubled. The light blue bars denote the hours that mothers contributed to childcare. And as I said, the fraction that they did is also given. And these are derived from a host of surveys that were done in April of 2020 and a ton of different assumptions. In September of 2020, we moved into a new world, into what I call the ACDC world because it's after Corona, but it's still during Corona and even more so now. Draconian pandemic restrictions were partially lifted. Daycare centers opened in most states in early summer but it is likely that far less than half of all the nation's public school children are in school full-time or will soon be in school full-time. In addition, about one third of adults who worked at home in May had returned to their workplaces at least per time by September. And among college graduates, about 40% had never worked from home, although women did so more than men. It is likely that in this ACDC world, total childcare and homeschooling hours are maybe about halfway between what existed BCE and what existed DC in March or April of 2020. Since schools and childcare are available in much of the country around half the weeks, possibly less now. For most college graduate workers, earnings and promotions rise with respect to uninterrupted hours of work, but children are now at home far more. And so the usual issues faced by all these couples, BCE, have been greatly magnified. One member of the couple will go back to work full time and be on call at the office as well and the other member of the couple will work from home and take care of the kids, and that parent will also be on call at home. And if history is any guide, or if district website graphics are, and this is a graphic from the Chicago Public Schools, if they are any guide, the person who will be at, uh, who will work at home and take care of the children's school needs will be a woman. 
There may have been no net gains for working women in the move from the DC world to the ACDC world. Their total hours are given, as I said, by the green bars, what they gained from school and daycare openings, they have lost from lower parental help at home. In consequence, their total hours remain about the same in the DC world, but their share of total childcare increases, as you can see. For most mothers, the ACDC world has become the BCE world on steroids. Let me end by saying what a solution might be. We need to find a safe way to have classes for children, for their futures, for their parents, and in particular, for women. As in the Great Depression of the 1930s, we have highly talented and unemployed or underemployed labor who could be put to work educating children, particularly those from low income families. We once had a Works Progress Administration CCC program, and we need a new CCC program, what I've called a civilian college corps to free parents, especially women to return to work and give work experience to unemployed college students. The core could support beleaguered parents too exhausted to correct essays and too confused to help with algebra. Other core members could be in the classroom helping districts cope with reduced numbers of older teachers. In our ACDC world, we must reduce the cost to parents of educating and caring for their children for the sake of the entire economy, for women in particular, and to improve learning for the future generation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor Golden. It's really fascinating because I tend to think much like in medicine, we think of a single disease at a time. We think of one social institution at a time, home, school, and <clears throat> your talk really represents the necessity of integrating how we think about those things. One idea that came up earlier in the course around provision of healthcare was the historical value of community healthcare workers, especially in a time of a pandemic. And I see your proposal of a civilian core of people who can assist in childcare and teaching to be similar in some ways to these notions about how to rely on community efforts in certain ways to relieve critical needs. So it's really a, a kind of fascinating connection to other elements that we've discussed. So our next speaker is Professor Badalano. So thank you very much for being here. Everyone, a uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Ingrid, for inviting me to join. I'm delighted to join this uh, wonderful group of uh, researchers and, and scholars today. So what uh, Alan and Ingrid have asked me to do today is to tell you about an initiative that I contributed to co-launching, which is all about uh, a critical issue related to democratizing work. And this initiative has important implications for women, but what I should say from the beginning is that uh, it's not focused exclusively on women. So I'm going to now talk about this initiative and, and help us think through the future of work and I highlight implications for gender issues and gender equality, but we'll not concentrate only on that dimension and I'll be building on what Claudia and Anna just shared. So I'll start by saying that uh, we're facing a, a crisis that is clearly a multi-dimensional crisis. Um, if we think about the, the, the situation, and I know that's something you've been covering over the course of the semester, we're obviously facing a, a tragic health crisis. But the crisis is also a socio and economic crisis. And um, Hannah and Claudia just very eloquently captured some critical aspects of this crisis for women. I know that you've already covered the, the, the importance of this crisis also and its implication for, for minorities. The truth is that, as we know, this crisis, the pandemic has increased existing inequalities. Now, I'll say that we're facing a crisis that's not only a health, a social and an economic crisis, but we are also facing an environmental crisis that has been ongoing for a long time now, and that represents an existential threat to human life, but not only to you know, all forms of life on this planet, really. 
And um, I would say that parts of the roots of this multidimensional crisis can be traced back to uh, the shareholder value maximization model that has been dominant uh, in the economic realm over the past 50 years, and that has contributed to a, a concentration of wealth, right, and power in the hands of a few, and to the destruction of the planet. So we're now facing this important moment where we can either stay the course, but if we stay the course, we know what's going to happen. It's now documented by research. We will further increase inequalities for certain categories of population. And we're talking today about women and gender, but you've already covered other important categories, right? Again, minorities, racial minorities, racialized communities, as well as, well as people who uh, belong to different kinds of social and socioeconomic classes. Uh, but so if we stay the course, we'll uh, increase inequalities and we further destroy the planet. So um, it's the desire to think about how to rebuild and, and how to think about our society and our economy differently that led me in the spring to get together with two of my colleagues, Isabel Ferreras and Dominique Meda, and we got together asking ourselves two questions. What does this multidimensional crisis teach us and what can be done about it? And so um, first thing is, what does it teach us? It's pretty obvious, you'll say, that human beings are much more than mere resources, right? And we're facing a paradox because we've put an increased emphasis on essential workers and the term is so well deserved and it's so critical to recognize the importance of their contributions. But yet these workers were, and I still treat it as anything but essential. If you think about levels of compensation and if you think about do they have a say when it comes to the strategic decisions of their organizations, the, the companies that employ them, right? And uh, so what seemed obvious to us at the time and, and also is still I think very current now is the need to better recognize the contribution of all these workers, including women workers, who are quite often, as Hannah and Claudia mentioned, in more complicated situations and, and whose work is not being recognized. The critical thing is recognizing the importance of the contributions of these workers and putting the people and the planet back at the center of our economic system. And so that led us to write an op-ed that we started drafting in uh, April uh, of you know, this year and the three of us worked together. And as we were working on this op-ed, which is all about the need to democratize, decommodify, and remedy it, and I'll tell you shortly about each of these principles, but as we were working on this op-ed, we also noted that women were underrepresented pretty much across the world uh, in the group of experts the media were turning to to try and better understand the economic, social, political implications of this crisis. So once we had our first draft of the op-ed, we turned to a group of nine uh, women, all experts in their academic field, and we ran the op-ed by them and asked them whether they would be interested in signing it. And their reaction was that, yes, they'd be delighted to sign it, but that we shouldn't stop at that group. What they wanted to do is circulate the document across larger groups in their academic communities to see what people would have to say. And what happened as a result of that is that over the course of just two weeks, uh, the document was circulating among you know, thousands of academics, researchers across the world. These researchers translated the article, contacted the newspapers, and the op-ed came out uh, on May 15th simultaneously on five continents, in 43 newspapers, in 36 countries. Uh, it was signed by over 5,000 researchers and academics. And if you have an interest in these issues, you can find all the information. We've created an initiative, the Democratizing Work Initiative. If you're interested, uh, no matter whether or not you're a researcher, you can sign. If you don't agree, you can participate in the debate because we need to think together about how we can rebuild and, and what we can do. Now, what we did as well, because we had a lot of demands, is that we wrote a book. It first came out in, in French. We just finished the English version of that book, that, so hopefully it will come out in the US soon. But we wrote that book to help people better understand these core principles of democratize, decommodify, and remediate that are rooted in the research we've been conducting. All the co-authors on this book are the women who were part of the, the, the first group of experts we turned to. So it's a book written by women for other women, but much beyond that to help all of us think and engage into this thinking on the future of work and how to rebuild. So let me say briefly uh, a few things about each of these principles. The first one is about 
the need to democratize firms, which is all about giving power and voice to employees, including to women, obviously employees, who too often are underrepresented still at the head of their organizations and on boards. So why democratize? First, because of social justice, right? The, the, the capital investors are represented, but the labor investors, the workers are not represented on the board, which is the place where all the strategic decisions get made. Now, the other reason why we should be democratizing is because it is time to combat excessive concentration of power in the hands of shareholders. I study power and politics. What's very clear and we know is that when people concentrate power in their hands, no matter what, they tend to abuse that power. That's always a risk. If you leave all the power in the hand of shareholders, no surprise, you get to a system of shareholder value maximization. What is at stake now is rebuilding some kind of a balance and keeping their power in check. And then last but not least, what I see in my own work is that the organizations that have more democratic ways of uh, deciding, making their critical decisions, these organizations are better able to pursue social and environmental goals alongside financial ones. Now, let's go beyond that and think about how can we democratize? Well, it's about giving workers power. And when I say workers, again, it's men and women. And we have to be thinking also across different groups and demographics in the organization because some groups are underrepresented among the minorities. So we have to think about making sure that we get workers to be represented on the board and they should have a real say, which means that just like the shareholders, they should have veto power. Now you'll be thinking, is that something that exists anywhere? Is it willful thinking? Is it even possible? Absolutely. It exists in Germany where we have the system of co-determination. So what I'm talking about is nothing completely new. We do have research that has documented such systems and we do know that such systems can be implemented. But again, it's about rebalancing power and distributing power differently. The second principle is about decommodifying work, which is recognizing that work is not a mere commodity, but that it is a right. Uh, so why decommodify? Uh, markets are not neutral, they're not fair, we know it. Uh, in fact, you know, if you think about women, for example, it is pretty clear that they've been discriminated against on labor markets and, and you know, the, the, the people on this panel today have conducted amazingly important research showing these things. So if markets were fair, we would know it, but if we leave it to market to decide for us, we leave it in fact to the powerful people on this market to decide for us. Now, the other reason why we need to commodify is because one thing we've learned from this pandemic and what it has reminded us is that there are sectors we need to protect from the, the sole laws of markets. Uh, and I'm thinking about education and healthcare. When you don't protect certain sectors, inequalities get to further and further increase. Uh, and last but not least, uh, when I talk about work as a human right, I'm referring to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 23. Uh, work is not a mere commodity, again, it's a right. So now how can we decommodify? Well, it's about allowing everyone access to a job that enables them to ensure their dignity and to provide for their community. And here again, uh, if you look around in a number of countries throughout the world, you can see at the moment people experimenting. Job guarantee programs exist. And now what's at stake is for all of us to think together about how can we scale them. And as we scale them, we again have to be very careful. We have to make sure that we include all of the groups. And when it comes to women, we have to think critically about how we make sure that they're not going to be disadvantaged, but on the contrary, that such programs will enable them to play the critical role that they should be playing uh, without having to constantly worry about being in precarious kind of situations. Now, finally, remediating the environment. It's all about committing to preserving our natural ecosystems. Why remediate? It's pretty obvious. Uh, we do have all the scientific data. Now, you know, it's a real existential threat for us and for all the species on the planet. Uh, we're already feeling uh, the, the, the consequences of climate change in our everyday life. Think about, for example, the fires that have happened so recently in California, in Australia, other critical uh, weather events that are affecting all of us. So now, how can one remediate? Uh, well, critical aspect here is that one thing we're going to have to do among others is require that workers from specific sectors transition, right? They migrate from more polluting sector to greener ones. And as we think about that transition, we have to make sure that we provide all the safety, the dignity that's necessary for worker to transitions. And that's why we need to decommodify. That's why we're going to need all of those job guarantee programs that I just mentioned. 
And then uh, importantly, it's also going to require that companies transition from the model of shareholder value maximization to a model that accounts for their social and, and environmental impact. And here again, I'm going back to the research I've been doing, the organizations that are more democratic that have already democratized are better able to do that. Importantly, among the ones I've seen, women are represented on the boards and on all of the groups that are making the critical decision. So uh, based on all the work I've seen, the work of other people, I think we have reasons to hope, but the changes I'm talking about require a transfer of power. It's never easy to implement these changes, but I'm hopeful because we have models. And so we're not only agitating against the status quo, now we can innovate and the next challenge will be to orchestrate the change. Thank you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> that was just a fantastic um, presentation and a kind of remarkable story of how you have used your scholarship to develop both a understanding of what's happening in the pandemic, what it reveals, and what people can do about it. And I think one of the most impressive things that Ingrid and I have found in putting the course together is this relationship between universities, university scholarship, academic research, and trying to both remediate the pandemic, but also think in terms of different forms of social advocacy around the problems that the pandemic has clarified. So I congratulate you on this work. It's a great story of how thinking about things can take off and you know, we've seen a lot of bad representations of social media, but here's one in which your ideas and thinking with your colleagues has really reached an incredibly broad audience. So it's very, it's, it's very gratifying to see such important work reach such a big audience. So thank you very much. Our last speaker is Professor Sarah Richardson. And um, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me just get, here we go. Okay. Um, so as Ellen mentioned, uh, I am uh, uh, the director of the Harvard Gender Sci Lab, which is an interdisciplinary collaborative space that brings together social scientists uh, philosophers and scientists from a range of fields. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, one of the things that we took note of were the early emerging patterns that showed a much higher rate of poor outcomes for men compared to women. And this is really something that we specialize in, uh, thinking about sex difference claims in a health and biomedicine context. So we started to examine those patterns and try to understand them um, with respect to the existing public health literature and our own understandings of how sex and gender interact to produce health outcomes. So the headlines shown on this slide exemplify how biological sex has been foregrounded in, as a primary explanatory factor in these COVID-19 sex disparities. I'll note that early on in the pandemic, uh, as many as the ratio was as high as two to one in male deaths to female deaths um, in China, in Italy, and in uh, the early surge in New York. Um, so this very concerning disparity in outcomes. Um, so biological sex has been foregrounded in explanations of these differences in rates of mortality due to COVID-19 between men and women. Now, um, a concern is that a focus on biological sex can obscure gender related and other social factors that are potentially as or more relevant than biological sex in shaping vulnerability to COVID-19. And so in this presentation, I'll be centering gender and other social and demographic variables to offer alternative ways of understanding, investigating and talk about inequities in the pandemic. So, uh, there is some key terminology that you'll need to be acquainted with for the approach that I'll be taking in this presentation. So most of you have probably heard of gender and sex and the distinction between them before. Gender referring to cultural conventions, roles and behaviors for, as well as relations between and among women and men and boys and girls. 
sex in contrast referring to biological characteristics enabling so sexual reproduction such as gonads and chromosomes. The term gender sex might be unfamiliar to many of you, um, but it is a central construct for the work that we do in the lab for th thinking about disparities between women and men. This is an umbrella term for both gender, i.e. socialization and sex, evolved biological traits, um, and reflect social locations or identities where gender and sex cannot be easily or at all disentangled. And using the term gender sex rather than sex or gender, as I will often do in this presentation, calls attention to two critical points. Even in cases where it is theoretically possible to do so, we currently lack the data needed to separate the effects of gender and sex. And without such disaggregation, the term gender sex is more appropriate than sex or gender to describe these findings. Gender sex also highlights the need to insistently pair sex, sex disaggregated COVID-19 data with social variables and other demographic variables such as age in order to identify tractable points of intervention into disparities in the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic. Now, one thing I wanna note before I go into further discussion as well, is that I'll be discussing public health data um, and public health agencies, most of them, very, very few exceptions, collect data on COVID-19 using a binary model of gender sex, female, male, and women, um, men, and disaggregating data this way into male and female categories, of course, will exclude or miscategorize many individuals. And as a result, there are critical gaps in knowledge about COVID-19 and the way it impacts intersex, trans, and non-binary communities. And I'll be happy to answer questions about that in the discussion. Act disparities in COVID-19 outcomes between men and women. This is some data from the Harvard Gender Sci Labs US Gender Sex COVID-19 Data Tracker, which shows that there is significant variation in mortality across geographic locations in the US alone. So if there is a biological sex disparity in outcomes, one would expect it to be quite stable, quite a bit more stable across localities, geographies, and social locations. Um, so how do we explain this variation? Why is it that in Massachusetts, for instance, women are more likely to die than men, while in New Jersey and DC, men are much more likely to die than women? Why is it that mortality rates are so close for women and men in Kentucky? We also have this data longitudinally, and I'll be happy to answer more questions about this project. This graph shows the ratio of age-adjusted mortality rate among women over the age-adjusted mortality rate among men over time, and how this is basically how this has changed week to week. And each of the lines represent a different U.S. state, a ratio value of one. Oh. to context specific social factors to understand what truly lies behind gender sex disparities in specific localities. Okay, so we also know that um, there's great variation in COVID-19 outcomes across social groups. Um, so racial disparities in COVID-19 outcomes have drawn attention to how the legacies of structural racism and white supremacy contribute to health disparities and racial segregation in housing, zip codes, and occupational roles correlate with increased risk of death from COVID-19. Um, for example, Black and Latinx Americans are overrepresented in all health care support and personal care care service occupations, as well as in many high exposure professions such as food service, transportation and delivery, manufacturing, construction and security services. Here's some uh, new findings from our lab. Uh, we are the first to look at the intersection of race and sex. Um, and there are only two states reporting data that would allow us to do that. That's Georgia and Michigan. Uh, the, our analysis of data coming from these two states reveals that number one, black women have died at higher rates than white men, okay, um, in both locations. Um, and therefore, what we see here is that the mortality rates of men are not universally higher 
than the mortality rates of women. But furthermore, the gender gap varies in magnitude across social groups. Gender sex disparities among Black Americans are greater than they are among white Americans. And I'll turn to some possible explanations for this in a moment. In light of this variability, sex-linked biology seems inadequately positioned to explain the differences observed between and within racial groups in the US. Instead, we would expect the root causes of such disparities to be complex and likely linked to occupational exposures, histories of discrimination and resource deprivation, socially rooted differences in comorbidities and healthcare access and other contextual variables. Here's another question that we might ask. How reliable, complete, and valid is our data on COVID-19 outcomes among men and women? So here is a, a graphic that's gone around quite a bit showing really dramatic differences between outcomes for men and for women. Now, this is a case fatality rate um, uh, graph. And what we need to note is that case fatality rates um, are not the same thing as mortality rates. They are a different construct. A mortality rate is the number of deaths from COVID-19 in a particular population scaled to the size of that population. A case fatality rate represented in the figure on the slide refers to the number of deaths among confirmed cases. Now, case fatality rates are calculated by dividing the total number of confirmed deaths by the total number of confirmed cases. And in the case of COVID-19, Gender sex disparities, case fatality rates for women and men are calculated by dividing the number of women or men who died from COVID-19 by the total number of women in one case or men who were diagnosed with COVID-19. Obviously a key assumption of this is that for case fatality rates to be accurate and reliable, COVID-19 cases among women and men have to be detected at an equal rate. However, we know that certain groups are more likely to get tested for COVID-19 than others, and that factors related to gender sex influence access to tests, or even the simple likelihood that a person gets tested. Um, and so we can look at how the striking disparity seen on the previous slide between the pink and blue bars, um, although it would be likely enough to convince anyone that gender disparities in COVID-19 mortality are great, and perhaps insurmountable. We might consider that, for instance, pregnant individuals and healthcare workers, both of whom are overwhelmingly female, are more likely to get tested for COVID-19. This increases the likelihood that asymptomatic and mild cases of COVID-19 among women are detected. And with more cases being detected, the total number of women who die from COVID-19 might appear like a small fraction of all cases, hence the lower case fatality rate for women compared to men. This points to the necessity of carefully examining the social, economic, and cultural factors that can affect testing, and therefore metrics such as the case fatality rate. And to date, we really lack data on the testing rates for women and men, although some emerging data does suggest uh, much more testing among women. Uh, here's another question that we might ask. Examining pre-COVID-19 mortality rates in Massachusetts and comparing them to mortality rates during the COVID-19 surge reveals that compared to baseline conditions, i.e. Um, average mortality rates for men and women over the last five years for these exact same weeks in the this in Massachusetts shows that there is a pre-existing mortality gap between men and women. This is work by Nancy Krieger out of the School of Public Health that shows that during the intensive weeks of the surge in Massachusetts, the mortality for both men and women went up, gap remained the same. Okay, the surge affected men and women equally. If this finding is generalizable, the disparity in COVID-19 outcomes between men and women does not have to do with a specific male vulnerability to the virus that causes COVID-19, but reflects a baseline propensity of men and women to die in any given year. So the dotted lines show the average mortality for women and men in Massachusetts from January to mid-April for the years 2014 to 2019, red for women, blue for men, and uh, the solid lines show the mortality registered in Massachusetts for women and men this year between January and mid-April, okay? Uh, so you can see the surge happening and the identical uh, increase. So that is 
when we contextualize disparities in COVID-19 mortality between women and men uh, relative to pre-COVID-19 disparities, um, that helps us understand relative excess deaths and where we should locate causality. Um, just a few more points. Um, we are also concerned about over undercounting of um, women's deaths. Uh, so according to the New York Times, uh, as of se September 16th, 2020, more than 77,000 residents and workers of nursing homes uh, and other long-term care facilities have died of COVID-19. And the number reported by the Times is 40% higher than those reported by federal authorities on the same date indicating significant gaps in data reporting about COVID-19 in nursing homes um, and that this continues to exist. Considering that women represent about 70% of the U.S. nursing home population, gaps in this data reporting could bias the conclusion we draw from current data. And this also could explain some of the variation we see among states. Um, so I'll just skip over this for time. Um, wide consensus that nursing home deaths are under under counted. Now, what, how can we theorize then the role, what factors might be playing a role here? Well, we have a good historical reservoir of cases of pandemics, the sex disparities and outcomes. And in an op-ed earlier this year in the New York Times, I reviewed some of these cases and I'll just quickly touch on them here. Uh, here is the flu pandemic uh, of 1918, which has been widely compared in some dimensions to this current pandemic. In 1918, men also died from the flu in larger numbers than women, similar to what we're seeing now with COVID-19. There's been many excellent retrospective analyses of these patterns, um, which show upon closer analysis that this sex disparity was driven primarily by specific groups of men that were disproportionately affected by the flu because of their occupational status, a social variable. The uh, men in the military and unskilled manual labors died at much higher rates than the general population. And this was likely because engaging in social distancing was harder for men in these occupational categories. There were no sex disparities at the end of the pandemic in mortality from the flu among non-military upper classes where men and women died at similar rates overall. And because of the other factor is that because of their more limited ability to socially distance, men also entered the 1918 pandemic with higher rates of TB compared to women. And this made them more likely to die after contracting the flu virus. So we see that in the 1918 flu pandemic, sex disparities arose mainly due to gender related differences in both occupation and pre-existing conditions. I see that there's a message for me, but I can't view it on my screen. Um, let me know by hand signal if I need to <laughs> wrap up. Um, more recently, we can look at related, closely related coronavirus um, epidemics, similar patterns. Here's SARS in 2003 uh, caused by another coronavirus. And during SARS, men also died at a higher rate than women. But sex differences and fatality rates varied significantly across age groups, and this provided a clue. The lower fatality rate among women compared to men um, could be found primarily among younger groups. And this was found to be primarily driven by high infection rates among healthcare workers, just as I discussed earlier. Healthcare workers were predominantly female, but also young and otherwise healthy. They were, in other words, more likely to survive a SARS infection. And the high rates of infection among healthcare workers created the illusion that in younger age groups, women were more, were more likely to survive SARS than men. Uh, no significant sex differences in fatality rates were observed at older ages and subsequent analyses accounting for age, occupation, and pre-existing conditions showed that men and women had similar fatality rates for SARS across all age groups. So once again, gender behaviors, pre-existing conditions, and gender segregated occupational exposures proved to be clear in explaining the sex differences that puzzled so many at first. And there can be no more stark example than MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, also a coronavirus uh, outbreak in 2012 that primarily affected countries in the Middle East. Um, and MERS also exhibited a pattern of higher ma male mortality, overwhelmingly affecting older men. And camels are the key source of infection 
humans contracted MERS through direct or indirect contact with infected camels. And in Saudi Arabia, camel handling and slaughtering are primarily male occupations. Analyses accounting for age, pre-existing health status and occupation have shown that fatalities actually do not differ from sex, even though 80% of the fatalities were among men. So sex doesn't account for this, it's occupation um, and pre-existing health status. Okay, um, you're probably already thinking of lots of gendered variables that could contribute to these patterns when it comes to COVID-19. Um, I'll put a few of these out here. I know we need to move quickly. Um, you know, gender and social factors most certainly um, are influencing COVID-19 gender sex disparities. Polls have shown that men in the US are more likely to downplay the severity of the harm potentially caused to them by COVID-19. Men are less likely to wear masks due to the pressure to perform masculinity. Gender-related behavioral factors can influence compliance with other kinds of public health recommendations, including hand washing, proactively seeking medical help, and the observance of social distancing policy measures. Men in the US and across a variety of other geographical contexts have been found less likely to support and follow preventative measures of this kind and to delay seeking medical help when symptoms appear. In addition, men tend to have higher rates of tobacco use and alcohol consumption, both of which are considered risk factors for severe COVID-19 outcomes and increased mortality. We can look at gender segregated structures of high exposure jobs, which I mentioned previously. And on the other hand, that women staff the majority of healthcare support positions in the US, um, where they are more likely to get infected, but, all at, but also more likely to get tested and more likely to survive given their health status. Um, so I'll just highlight one more thing, comorbidities. Um, comorbidities highly, highly correlate with COVID-19 outcomes. Here's just a selection, a handful from the CDC of disparities in comor comorbidities between men and women pre-existing in the population. The unequal distribution of comorbidities among men and women and across social groups likely influences these COVID-19 disparities. So in the US, you can see that men are more likely than women to have hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Men are again, more likely to smoke, make use of excessive alcoholic beverages. And all of these conditions are correlated with severe COVID-19 outcomes. Okay, so just to conclude, um, the sweeping claim that men experience poorer outcomes from COVID-19 than women is not true for all men in all localities. There's limitation on data collection that hinders our ability to draw strong conclusions about this. And this is what our tracker is trying to address. And prior experience suggests that social and demographic factors are likely the primary drivers of this disparity uh, for men. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Richardson for that incredibly compelling talk. And thank you all to our speakers. I think you have highlighted some of the fundamental issues um, in this moment in COVID and also prior to this. And I appreciate um, in this last conversation, both the, the relevance of the intersectionality that we have to consider in this context and also the differential that pre-existed in terms of mortality and these gender differences. So with that in mind, we have just a few minutes. Let's try to bring in at least one or two students to ask some questions. Yvonne, would you mind bringing in some students? 